Evening, ladies and gents. It's uh, Simon Brown speaking here. This evening we got Keith McLachlan um, coming. He's we've done the the uh, four pillars of fundamental investing, and he went through those four individual pillars. Now he's uh, stepping it up a notch or two. We're doing whack and things, weighted average cost of capital. Uh, certainly a phrase I've heard before. A phrase I have little clue as to what it really, really means. Um, over the next 20 minutes or so, Keith will make us smarter. Uh, Keith, over to you. Simon, uh, thanks for that. Uh, guys, if you remember, we had the four pillars of equity fundamentals we've worked through. The first one being profitability. Uh, profits are simply the aim of business. Um, so what we're looking there, uh, what we're looking for there is, is sustainable growing profits. It's the hallmark of profitability. Um, then we had a, I had a look at liquidity. It's simple. Uh, liquidity is cash is king. And it's how you generate it and how you manage it. Uh, working capital and cash generation are key there. Then we, uh, we touched on solvency. Uh, debt, is, debt is really a trade-off against leveraging of profits and profitability from a shareholder perspective and increasing business failure risk. Um, so you want the optimal mix. And that's that's we're going to touch on as well when, when we have a look at WAC a little bit later. Uh, finally, there's, there's a qualitative aspect to any business, and arguably the most important is management. Um, how they run it, how they, uh, how they manage it uh, going forward, all the soft factors. So those are the four pillars of uh, equity fundamentals. Um, nice and broad, nice and general, just, just reminding you guys on them here. Uh, now we can start to get a little bit more applied. Um, Tonight we're looking at the cost of equity and the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, let's start off by defining them. Uh, cost of equity is defined as the required rate of return shareholders demand for accepting the risk of providing the share capital. Think about that. It's, it's the required rate of return that shareholders demand for accepting the risk of providing the share capital. So if you put your business into a risky venture, you've got to be compensated for that or else you take your money elsewhere. Likewise, if you put your money into an extremely safe business, um, that same level of compensation doesn't need to be that high. So it's actually the cost of equity is a dance between risk and reward. Then let's have a, have a look at WAC. WAC is the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, it gets tedious to, uh, to call it that, so we're just going to call it WAC from now on. Um, it's, it's simple. It's the total cost of a firm's capital. Total cost. Taking into account all the different amounts of debt and equity and all other financing structures. So the emphasis here is on total cost of a firm's capital. This you notice the subtle difference between uh, cost of equity and cost of WAC. Cost of equity is from a shareholder perspective. WAC is actually from a group-wide full business perspective. Uh, so we've defined the terms. Let's have a look at the cost of equity and actually look at how we calculate it. Put a real number on it. Uh, there's, two, there's two broad approaches. There are diff other approaches out there, but we've only got half an hour or so to talk through this. And I, I, want to, I want to have the basic building blocks here. So the first one is what they call the dividend capitalization model. It essentially says that the cost of equity, if you looked at it from one, a single share's perspective, would be the dividends per share divided by the share price plus the dividend growth rate is equal to the cost of equity. Dividends per share divided by the share price is actually the dividend yield. Uh, it, it is the cash that you receive as a minority shareholder. The dividend growth rate going forward is the growth of the company. So it's a balance between those two things. Um, so actually, interestingly, it may or may not mean anything to you guys now, but if you take the dividend capitalization model and you rearrange the formula, you get left with the Gordon growth model. And that is a valuation model we will touch on in, the, in a later in a later um, webinar. So the real problem with the dividend capitalization model is that the dividend growth rate is a weak link in this model. 
How do you get that? Well, you just think about it for a while. It's easy to take the dividend per share, and it's easy to divide it by the share price. But what is the dividend growth rate? Dividends don't always grow in a straight line compared to profits. Uh, or, I mean, not even that, not to say that profits grow in a straight line, but they don't necessarily even track profits sometimes. It can go through long extended periods of being raised or lowered or dropped or changed that is actually driven by management's policy, shareholder policy, um, and perceptions of the future that are either right or wrong. Do you see how finding the dividend growth rate, whereas it's a major input into this model, it is also a major variable? that, that uh, has forecast risk in it. Um, so dividends per shares is dependent on policy. Dividend capitalization model, it is an approach. It's easy to understand, but it isn't the best one, in my opinion. We touch on the capital asset pricing model, CAPM. Now, CAPM is simple. It says that in, in any economy, you get the risk-free rate of return. I just call it the risk-free rate. Then, that, the risk-free rate is what you would earn if you invested in an asset that had absolutely no risk involved with it. So, remember I said there's a dance between risk and reward? Hence, the risk-free rate, um, its risk is very low. Thus, uh, in, in an efficient market, its return will also be very low. But hence... When you start to look at slightly riskier assets, you have to be compensated for that. And particularly, uh, the CAPM model works very nicely from an equity market perspective where they talk about the market risk premium. Now, the market risk premium is, is how much you're earning over the risk-free rate investing in the JSC or investing in the Dow Jones or investing in the Nikkei or, or wherever because you have to be compensated for that extra risk. And then there's this little word called beta in this, um, in this equation. And it's, it's simply a beta defines the market. If something moves in line with the market, then uh, it's got a beta of one, i.e. for every 1% the market moves, it moves in the same direction, 1%. Um, Thus, if, if something is very volatile, uh, it'll have a beta larger, larger than one or smaller than minus one. But beta tracks market. So what we're doing in this model is we're saying, yes, you're looking at the whole asset class, uh, market, market risk premium, uh, times by the beta. Let's uh, just touch on those principles. Risk-free rate. We tend to view it as the government bond of, of, of the uh, economy the business is operating in, or the major portion of the business is operating in. The, the risk-free rate in South Africa is not the same as the risk-free rate in the US. We have different risks here, and hence our rates and our yields will, will run differently. Market risk premium um, would be the total Aussie return less the risk-free rate. In this case, the total, total Aussie return less government bond return. That shows you how much you're being compensated for, uh, taking that extra risk. And then beta, let's call it the amount of market risk. If a share is, uh, or a company is riskier than the general market, its beta will be, will be greater than the market. Okay. CAPM, let's use an example. Uh, just to put all this theory, because theory is great and well, but how does it, how do you use it? Um, Capitum example, say the 10-year 10 10 year bonds in South Africa are trading at a 10% annual yield. They're not, by the way. I just like working with easy numbers here. The 10-year bonds are trading at 10% annual yield. 10 years is a nice long time, time horizon, so we get a nice, nice long view of the economy there. 10%, can, we can say, is our risk-free rate. The Aussie total return is 15% per annum. Notice I used total return. That includes dividends. And we're looking at Anglo-American. It has a beta. It's, it's a commodity company. It's a very big one, so a little safer than the small guys, but it is still a commodity, uh, commodity oriented group. And it has a beta of 1.1. So it's a little riskier than the market. How do we actually do this? The risk-free rate is 10%. We, we agree on that 10% because it's the 10-year bond uh, annual yield. 
Then the market risk premium, why do I say it's 15% less 10%? Because if I can earn 10% in, uh, in risk-free bonds, um, and the Aussies returning 15%, I'm being compensated for the Aussies, the total return. But how much more? It's simple. It's, it's the total return from the Aussie, less, less the bonds. So market risk premium here is 5%. 15% less 10% leaves me with 5%. Uh, thus, if I use um, the equation I had back here, risk-free rate times beta or plus beta times the market risk premium, um, I'm left with with a uh, that uh, shareholders in Anglo because of its risk. The cost of equity is 15.5%, which is the 10% uh, risk-free rate, plus the beta times the market risk premium. This is how much, 5% is how much the market, if you bought the entire market, um, you would demand for that risk. And there's a little riskier than the market. That's why we times by the beta, and you're left with 15%, 15.5% uh, 15 return. This is not just the cost of equity, this is the required r rate required returns of any shareholder in, in Anglo. I'll ignore the fact in this example that Anglo is a, as a global buyer, we should be looking at uh, non-South African uh, risk-free rates and things like that, but that we, we have a simplified example here. So continuing the Anglo example, if half of Anglo's capital is debt, half of its capital, its full capital base, so for every one rand or one dollar of debt that Anglo has, it has one rand or one dollar of shareholder wealth to back it up. In other words, if you, if you go back to the webinar where we had to look at solvency ratios, there was a debt to equity ratio. In this example, the debt to equity ratio would be 1.0, i.e. one rand of debt for every one rand of a shareholder wealth. Now, say Anglo borrows because it's a big company, it borrows at an interest rate of 10%. It's actually borrowing at, uh, at, at in this example, uh, government bond rate. Extremely good credit Anglo has, so they give them, give them very cheap finance. The tax rate is 30%. Ooh, never forget tax in this. Shareholder dividends are not tax deductible, but when you're running a business and you have loans in it and you pay interest on those tax, uh, or you pay interest on those loans, that tax is generally deductible. Oh, that, that interest is generally deductible for tax. So, the after-tax cost of debt in Anglo is actually 7%, not 10%, because they get to claim that 30% uh, 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 tax rate. Hence, yeah, we have a look at the little equation at the bottom here, 10% times um, the after-tax rate. So, what is the total cost of capital of Anglo? In the previous example, we calculated the cost of equity. Now, Anglo also has debt. So, what we're calculating has the WAC. So, logically, if half the company is funded out of equity and half the company is funded out of debt, equities earn, equity costs Anglo 15.5% of return because they have to provide it to us, the shareholders are going to get uh, angry and pull their money elsewhere. And um, the debt is 7%, and half of, their, half of it's being funded by 7%. You can see how logically the way to calculate it would just be, just be the different weightings times the different, uh, different amounts. In this case, the cost of equity times the amount of equity, plus the cost of debt times the amount of debt. 15.5% times a half plus the total of 7% uh, 7, uh, 7 times a half equals 11.25%. That's Anglo's WAC, their weighted average cost of capital. Now, why is that important? Because if Anglo was looking or found a new mine, found a prospect or pro potential project, and they and and they calculate, they crunch the numbers, they drill their holes, and they uh, and it's a fantastic uh, mine, potential mine they could build there, and they find that it returns that they, it has an internal rate of return on their forecast uh, 
you know, if they were to start the mine bull that they, they estimate they, they would return 13%. Should they do it or shouldn't they do that? Now remember their cost of equity is 15%. So it sounds like this return is lower than the cost of uh, equity. But half of this project is being financed by debt that you only need to pay its interest and then all the profits accumulate to the shareholders after that. So actually, because of their leverage, their financial leverage and the gearing in the business, and their WAC being 11.25, their WAC is lower than, than the internal rate of return of this project of 13%. Hence, it actually makes financial sense to go ahead with the project. So WAC is important. Well, let me, let me phrase it this way. The cost of equity is the shareholders' required rate of return. It's a critical variable from a shareholder's perspective. You use it in dividend, mo uh, dividend discount models, whether well, it's spoken about Gordon growth models, amongst other models. We will touch on these in later webinars. Now, WAC is a company's required rate of return. It's the product of equity mix, uh, equity risk profile and the choice of gearing and other financial structures like, for example, preference shares and things. It's used in a discounted free cash flow model, DCF model, if you've heard of that, amongst others. Once again, we will touch on this in a later webinar. Um, so that's, that's the difference between the two. But let's touch on some practical uh, advice, not just examples and theory. JSC rules of thumb for the CAPM model when you're trying to work out the cost of equity is that uh, SA's risk-free rate, uh, rate on our 10-year bonds is a good example of what, what our risk-free rate really, really is. Don't take the 5-year bonds too short. The 20-year bonds are actually sometimes too long. 10, 10 years is a nice benchmark. You can, you can find those as public information on www.resbank.co.za for our South African Reserve Bank. Um, take it as a rule of thumb. Just trust me on this one. The JSC's risk premium is about 5%. It can get elevated and it can drop in and things, but you know, on average, if you're looking at a long, long-term uh, scheme of things, it's about five percent. Um, also, do not trust published betas. See if they make sense first. If there's a small cap out there that has a beta smaller than one, its beta is distorted because of statistical anomalies and its illiquidity. Um, being that betas can only going to be built off price, and if the price doesn't move, it looks like the shares defensive. So apply logic when looking at published betas. And if it doesn't feel right, given, given how risky you think the company is, don't use it. Make your own. And this is where the second point comes in. If there's no beta or you have to make your own, then judge it according to risk. And risk is volatility. The more volatile the share, the business, the revenues, the profits, the higher the beta. That's the rule of thumb. I, we could talk long uh, like a quite a bit about this, but just take it at face value, and we'll probably touch on this a lot, a lot later when we're doing valuation examples. Um, finally, if you see preference shares in the structure, preference shares are definitely part of WAC. They're not necessarily part of equity, though. So, if the preference shares are sitting in the equity portion of the balance sheet, treat them as equity. If the preference shares are lying in the liabilities portion of the balance sheet, treat them as non-tax deductible debt. Preference shares declare dividends, don't get tax deductions for that. In fact, you pay STC, well, very soon you won't be, uh, it'll be withholding tax, but treat them as non-tax deductible debt um, in your weightings and in your allocations. Then the conclusion, cost of equity, the required rate of return demanded by shareholders. It is a function of business risk. The higher the risk, the higher the cost of equity, and the higher the implied return as well. Um, CAPM is a nice, easy tool for calculating cost of equity. Uh, WAC includes all financing aspects of business. Uh, debt is cheaper than equity, so it will lower a company's WAC below its cost of equity as they start to borrow more and more and more but it also increases the risk of business failure um, and it needs to be judged and balanced accordingly. Uh, finally, cost of equity and WAC is critical inputs into valuation models. I know what we've spoken about now seems like a lot of theory and a lot of background, um, but it's, it's critical that you understand this as we start going into practical valuation models. And you'll see how, what's probably, probably good, 
is in, a, in six months' time, come back and watch this again. And it is it'll cement your knowledge in where, where the cost of equity and WAC fits into all of this once you've done some valuation models. Guys, open to questions there. Good. Thanks, Keith. We're getting a, a bunch of questions through. A um, couple from uh, Simperia. He says, can we trust risk-free rate after the U.S. got downgraded? Short answer is Simperia. Probably not, but it's what we got. Um, another question from Simperia, and, and okay, let me grab Susan's quick. Susan says, can't we just uh, get our... Uh, she says, this looks very complicated. Can't we get it from our stockbroker? Short answer, you can. And she says, particularly, she wants Keith to be her stockbroker. Um, small cap stock, Kozar, and Tebe stockbroking. He is the senior equity analyst. You'll find him there. Simperia is also asking, where do you find beta? And I don't know if he's got an easy answer or, or an easy definition, because I've spoken... Okay. Let me start with the risk-free rate, uh, rate of return there. Well, in reality, nothing's risk-free. The U.S. has found out that the hard way. Uh, but what, what we're working here is we're working with theory to conceptualize it in the perfect world. And then as we start to apply it, you'll see how in, in, in practical world, you, 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 know, you, you have to take into account the different variances, different circumstances, and have to step outside of theory sometimes when the circumstances suit. So risk-free rate of return is a good benchmark, and bear in mind what the U.S. has done has influenced our bond markets too. So our yields are just. We're sitting in the global world here. Um, so the most important thing is that you match your risk of return for the economy you're valuing the asset within. Then what is, what is the other question? Uh, second part was well, there, there, there's a lot of published resources on beta. Uh, you can find them on, uh, like, a, I know OST, Standard Bank's uh, online brokerage site has them. That they have, they have five-year betas, because a beta is calculated over a period of time comparing the movement in the share to the movement in the Z. Um So it also depends over what period of time you compare it, because businesses change, business models change, the Z changes, the, I mean, even the, even the, Index in which the Aussie operates and the constituents there on their weightings change. So everything changes. Um, so make sure you understand the longer period of the beta, the better. Um, that said, some shares just haven't been listed that long. So OST has a five year beta. If you look at Profiles Handbook, um, they publish it. Uh, they have a three year beta and a one year beta in some cases. Um, then, you know, it's easy to say stockbrokers should have those, but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's probably 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 easy to find it off these published uh, published material. And then uh, I think muted. The other question is, where do you work? The answer is David Stockbroke. Sorry, I, I deleted the people who asked the question. It was the same question came from two, so I can't remember who you were. Apologies. But asking, how do you use WAC to find the value in a company? Is it a, a standalone, or does it fit into other formulas we're going to be doing? That Unmuted. Well, the, the best way to say it is yes, it fits into other formulas we went down the line. Pro problem is we've got a, a got a, a a time period that we can only have this webinar for. So we don't. I could uh, talk for three hours and go straight into DCFs and you know, like dividend discount models and things like that, where, where cost of equities and WAC start to become very, very uh, obvious how you use them. But this is why I said that when we start touching on the valuation models, perhaps go back and watch this webinar again, just to refresh yourself. I had to do, do this, uh, do the cost of equity and WAC before we do the valuation models, but it, um, because we have to cover that ground, but it won't, like I said, it, it, it probably will make a lot more sense once you see it in use in valuation models. Muted. Folks, if you've got more questions, you can use the text box at the bottom of the application. If you've got a microphone attached, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll activate your microphone. Um, Simperia says he's just Googled beta and he's actually found some uh, uh, formulas for it. And many stockbrokers, uh, OST, one of them, and I know them because obviously I was there for a number of years, you've got the data, so run it through the Excel formula and it'll come out and do it. Uh, Keith Stefan is asking, how do you relate to compare the calculated cost of equity 
um, to a company's actual performance. And that kind of ties in follow and follow up from Susan, who says, is there a direct relationship or is it very much more just about uh, feeding into to future uh, uh, webinars we'll be doing? Unmuted. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to answer this question. I, I think I understand where you guys are coming from. It's, you know, in, in a perfect world, the required rate of return on equity will equal the return on equity. Um, but, what, but because there's business risk, um, risk doesn't always work out and implies that sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, your, your actual return does not equal your, your, your cost of equity. And that's, that's the shareholder risk. Um, and that's also why share prices change. And not just in a linear movement upwards as the time value of money unwinds, but they move downwards as well. And, uh, because business fundamentals change and, uh, cost equity is not necessarily a constant. It's almost an economy <laughs> um, uh, Another one from, uh, the uh, will you be doing webinars on uh, free cash flows and how WAC is incorporated? Short answer is absolutely, uh, as Keith has said, uh, the, the, you've got 30 minutes here and that includes Q&A. If we gave him, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks, we could do it in one shot. Uh, it's an ongoing process. That we, we do at least one, one a month from Keith. And there are, of course, the ones he referred to up front in the webinar. Um, four pillars of fundamentals, that was a series of five. Uh, the four pillars and then delving into each of them. Um, and they're obviously online and available for viewing and downloading. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. That being the case, I'm muted. TV here for this evening. Um, as always, remember you'll find Keith at uh, Tip Stock Broking. Um, you'll also find him at smallcaps.coz and he's on Twitter. Keith McClachlan, uh, give him a follow. As always, Keith, thanks. I, I certainly took stuff away from it, and I like those formulas. I'm going to go and crunch them again and make sure I made perfect sense. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, guys.